Thanks for coming out, everybody. I'm always nervous that people won't show up <laughs> to watch. You know, to watch writers talk doesn't seem like a super exciting thing. So, thanks for coming. This is great. And it's great to be here with Rob Sheffield. Let's give Rob Sheffield a hand. It's great to be here with Stephen Hyden. I love this book so much. Uh, I've loved. Uh, I've loved this book for such a long time, and I've been arguing with it in my head and also with Stephen uh, for, uh, for over a year now. So it's really exciting to have the book come out and finally other people joining this, this contentious and, and long-running argument. Yeah, I just want to say, like, Rob um, is the nicest man in music <laughs> criticism. Like, he, like, read the book while I was writing it and was, like, the Tom Hagen for me, like, the consigliere. Um, and there's already a dean of American music critics, but you're the provost oh. of American music critics, as far as I'm concerned. So I just want to thank you publicly. Because honestly, you were like you were such a huge help, and like I felt like when I was done, even if everyone else thinks this book sucks, Rob Sheffield thinks it's good, so I don't care. What yeah, it took else a lot thinks. of willpower to f force me into an argument about <laughs> pavement versus smashing pumpkins. Right, thought, right. Is this, I never think about this kind of thing. Well, you know, I figure you know I got you know I was appealing to you. I was uh, reverse trolling you, I guess, whatever that is. Well, thank you for writing such a great book, and it's, it, again, it's exciting to see it come out and to see people joining in the argument. Uh, it's amazing because this is something about fan culture that it does not change. People love to argue about rivalries or feuds, which are similar but not quite the same thing. But pitting one rock star, one music star, one artist against another remains shockingly popular. Yeah, I mean, it seemed like um, a very sort of simple hook for a book. You know, like if you're going to do the elevator pitch for a book, that you could sum this up in one sentence or two sentences and people would understand what it was. Like it's about conflict and arguments and, you know, being in a bar and trying to decide who's the better person. Um, but I also liked it because it was a very open-ended idea, you know, that uh, you could start talking about a rivalry and kind of deliver the goods in that way, you know, the, the details and all the ridiculous things that happened, but then you could talk about other things, things that I found interesting, things that in a way, in my own head anyway, were like parallel issues, you know, to the rivalry. So uh, it was a really great vehicle in that regard, you know, because like when you write a book, you know, ideally I would have wanted to say, hey, I want to write a book about anything that I find interesting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but you can't really say that to a publisher, you know, you, you need a hook, you know, and, and the rivalries was a really good hook in that regard. Uh, it's, it, it, is it surprising to you that the rival, especially since the book comes out and people are exposed to your arguments, how personally people take these? Yeah, I mean, and that, that's not a surprise. And uh, I mean, it, it's interesting because like when I was writing the book, th initially the idea that I had was to make it much more of a straightforward rivalries book where I would be deciding like who I thought was better in the rivalry. Like it would be, like the idea I had originally was like, this would be a way to, you'd read this book and I'd give you tips on how to win arguments. Like if you got an argument with your friend, <laughs> I would give you like, you know, like debate prep to say like, this is why the stones are better than the Beatles. And like, these are the points you should use with your, with your pal. But um, as I thought about the idea more, that concept, you know, it wasn't as interesting to me. And it was less about deciding like who's better than, you know, this artist is better than this artist. And, uh, sort of exploring the dynamics of their relationship and like why people care about it and like why do we argue about this stuff and and that was more interesting to me than deciding like who was better than the other person so if that's the book you're expecting when you read it you might be disappointed but hopefully what I did will make up for that <laughs> so yeah I, I love how you leave it up to the reader which of Eric Clapton's 80s solo albums yeah prefer. you know although you're clearly a journeyman fan yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I like Journeyman, but you know, if you're a behind the sun person, <laughs> if you like the Phil Collins uh, See, records, I, I love how you uh, engage arguments that literally nobody else has <laughs> besides you. Well, you know, you gotta understand that, like, when I was a 12 year old boy, I watched a lot of VH1, and like <laughs> back in those days, VH1 like played 
um, like the idea for VH1 was like it was like MTV for older people, so they would play like Bruce Hornsby's like Mandolin Rain all day long, and like and I really you know I was like feeling Bruce Hornsby at that age, you know I was like uh, I hate the phrase old soul, but like I was you know a, a middle aged man at uh, twelve. <laughs> So, it, it, it's a, something I love. One of my favorite chapters is the Eric Clapton versus Jimi Hendrix chapter. Like a lot of chapters, I looked at the subject heading and I was like, this guy is insane. How can you <laughs> even make that argument? Eric Clapton would be the first one to say that there's no rivalry at all, which ends up being a, like a major factor in the chapter. And uh, it, it's fascinating because you roam over so much musical territory and emotional territory. One of my favorite sentences is in that chapter when you diverge for some reason reason you go into talking about Ween yeah. and the Ween discography and there's a great sentence that, that begins if you're a Ween fan you know that the pod is considered the difficult album <laughs> and I'm like literally nobody reading the Eric Clapton versus Jimi Hendrix chapter of any book knows which Ween album is the difficult Ween album <laughs> I, I love that you were able to combine so many different kinds of fandom in, in these arguments yeah well I mean I feel like that's something you know that I probably learned from reading people people like you that you know there's uh like when you're a music critic there's this idea that you need to have like an ideology or like an orthodoxy that like you apply to each record and it's like this is what i believe and i'm going to apply this matrix of values and ideas and this is how i'm going to evaluate things and i feel like the reality of it is that each of us brings so much baggage to everything that we hear and some of that is from music that we love some of it is from experiences that we've had you know there's just so many different things and in a way like i wanted this book to reflect that that like if i am going to talk about eric clapton you know the thing that draws me to eric clapton is the idea you know in that eric clapton Jimi hendrix chapter it's it's to me it's a proxy to talk about the idea of burning out versus fading away like are you, are you going to be the guy like Hendrix who's brilliant for a couple years um, and then he dies and he's forever fixed you know in that archetype of the guy at Monterey Pop who's lighting the guitar on fire and humping the guitar and he's always going to look amazing or are you going to be like Eric Clapton who you know by the 90s has like the Jason Priestley haircut and is doing like the bossa nova Layla and uh, unplugged, you know, and it's very easy to make fun of Eric Clapton in that respect. But like, as I started thinking about that, I found myself empathizing with Eric Clapton because I was like, you know, I'm sort of in that phase myself. You know, I don't have a Jason Priestley haircut, but like, I am trying to find a way to survive. You know, like I'm trying to carry forth and maintain my vitality as I get older, and that's something that is a common thing I think for everyone as they get older and that's how I was connecting with him on that level but you know so it was important for me to talk about Ween in that context, you know? <laughs> it was like, well, to better explain to you why I connected to Eric Clapton, I have to talk to you about, you know, going through a terrible period in my 20s where I was drinking a lot and listening to the pod and going through my own sort of darkness. You know, that was like my equivalent to recording Derek and the Dominoes, Layla, you know? <laughs> when, you know, that was my equivalent to being on heroin and lusting after... George Harrison's wife, you know, like that was my sort of uh, catharsis moment, you know, so I mean a book like this it really does require a lot of the reader you know you guys out there you know I, it really does mean that like you have to be able to take my hand and go on this journey with me even if it's like I'm going to be I, I'm always not going to be talking about the rivalry specifically I'm going to be taking you into areas where you might be confused for a while like what are you talking about is this going to pay off and hopefully it does pay off when you read it I think it does um but it is a windy trans, you know, it's a windy book with a lot, with a lot of uh, tangents in it, but I think it all comes back. And to me, it, it, that is reflective of how we experience music. It is like a mess of tangents and uh, weird uh, transgressions, but uh, 
it all kind of pays off in the end, hopefully. Are, so. are you, is it surprising for you that so many of the people in the book that you talk about slash make fun of <laughs> are uh, so making asses of themselves in, in 2016? Like, yeah, well, we were talking about this backstage because, yeah, there were, uh, there were a bunch of things that happened right before the book came out that sort of made things freshly relevant again. Like when I was writing about Kanye West and Taylor Swift, it's funny because, like, this is how, like, brilliant Rob is. Like I sent him, I, I wrote this chapter about Taylor Swift and Kanye West and their whole sort of thing at the 2009 VMAs and the things that have come out after that. And his note to me was, are you sure you don't want to write about Taylor Swift and Katy Perry? Because that seemed like the more relevant rivalry at the time. They were sniping at each other. And I was like, man, I think Rob's right. What am I going to do? Because like, you know. You've been vindicated by history. I know, because... <laughs> At the time, it seemed like Taylor Swift and Kanye West, you know, their whole thing seemed to be resolved for a long time. But then, you know, in February, Kanye puts out Life of Pablo. Is that song famous? And he's saying that he made Taylor Swift famous and that he could still have sex with her if he wanted to. and uh, Or I guess not still have sex with her. Have sex with her for the first time. Um, <laughs> presumably. Sorry. Sorry, Taylor. That was a slip of the tongue. Um, but uh, it was like, oh, this is, so like I saw that. I was like, oh, I wish I could write about this but I also thought oh this makes this chapter relevant again this is great or like you know I talk about Chris Christie there's a tangent about Chris Christie in my Nirvana Pearl Jam chapter and I'm like Chris Christie is Donald Trump's lackey this is great this is great he's kind of pathetic and he's kind of pathetic in my book too but sympathetic in a, in a weird way um, but then I'll then of course you know I wrote about Prince and Michael Jackson, and that was kind of a weird thing you know, with with Prince passing away so soon before the book came out. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's part of the weird, and you know this, like when you write a book, it takes a year for a book to come out, so you don't know how it's going to survive in that sort of transitional period from when you write it to when people start to read it. It's but almost it, like the stars that you write about in the book had a meeting you know, yeah. to decide, like, what can we do to make this really interesting? Like, Billy Corgan, you should probably talk about how Bernie Sanders supporters are like Stalinists. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, yeah, because like, yeah, I write about Billy Corgan going on Alex Jones's radio show in the book, and then he went back on Alex Jones's show. <laughs> Show, right before the book came out. I was like, this is great. But I was also like, as a fan, I was like, why are you doing this? <laughs> You're making yourself look like a lunatic. But that's also kind of good for my book. So I appreciate that. Oh, so, yeah. That, so, yeah, I was conflicted as a lover of Billy Corgan. Yeah, because... Well, because you're more of a, like, would you say you're, do you even like Smashing Pumpkins or? Yes. Okay, but you're, One of the best but you're, live but like, Hayman is like your band, right? Yes, yes. Uh, like like a lot of pavement fans, I, I like a lot of Smashing Pumpkins songs. It's not. I guess, I guess that's part of like another thing with these rivalries that things that seem you know, you know, black or white. You're on this side or that side, us or them. And as time goes on, and they come to seem more similar to each other and, and more on the same side. I mean, it's. I, I remember in the '90s when there was uh, a show with. Uh, Hip hop rivalry from the 80s. Uh, there was the crew from uh, Boogie Down Productions and the crew from Cold Chillin' Records doing a show together. And I remember seeing Roxanne Shante on stage with KRS One. I remember seeing this photo in The Voice and saying, My whole life has been a lie. Like, <laughs> nothing makes sense to me anymore. They're like, they're going up there, they're doing these songs, they're friendly, they're like, Yeah, this is showbiz. Like, I was like, You gotta be kidding. This was like really like, you know, I was an adult when I saw that picture, but I, I said, I cannot believe that this is happening, but the, the question of how much these rivalries how some of them recede over time and some don't. Yeah, well, I mean, I had a similar feeling when I saw, like, Noel Gallagher and Damon Albarn, like, <laughs> arm in arm yes. together. And I was like, oh, yeah. you know, like, this was a guy that you wanted to have AIDS in the mid-90s. Like, I don't know if you remember that quote. Terrible quote. Like, it was, he said, I think it was Noel Gallagher said, I want Damon Albarn and Alex James to catch AIDS and die. Which is like, and I, and I cheered for the other guy. I cheered for the guy who said that, <laughs> which is insane for me to do. But, yeah, I mean, I think if... if you know, this is a book that I think if you uh, 
when I wrote it, I knew that people would go to the table of contents and look at the bands that they were interested in, and they would just go to those chapters, and they would uh, read the book out of order. Like I figured that was probably going to be the common way that people would experience the book. But I did construct it like an album, you know, like that classic, <laughs> al like where the sequencing was important. And I thought, like, well, the rare reader who reads this in sequence, I think, will get some sort of emotional payoff if they read it that way, because it does start in this place, like the first chapter is about Oasis and Blur, which was like a huge thing for me when I was in high school, even though I was in America and like no one knew about Blur at all, like in the mid 90s, like a little bit later they did because they put out song two and that was like a big arena, like a sports arena anthem. But like in the mid 90s, it was like Oasis was huge in America and they were my favorite band in high school. So I start from that place where I'm just this like basically like a lunatic, like just loving Oasis so much. Starting from that place and then getting towards the end of the book where you get a little bit older and that sort of teenage idea where you want to draw lines in the sand and define yourself through culture, you know, and you're going to have arguments with people and if they don't side with you, then they're a bad person and the people who agree with you are good people and that whole idea. Getting older and, and not wanting to think in those terms, thinking more about what unites people and like wanting to be with people that don't seem like they're like you, but in reality they are like you because like, I, I feel like you know, you take the biggest Trump supporter and the biggest Bernie Sanders supporter and they probably have 98% of their ideas are probably in common. It's just the 2% that drives them apart. That's what I believe anyway. And kind of getting to that place. And for me, uh, a big thing in that regard was learning to love Toby Keith. Because <laughs> um, my last chapter is about Toby Keith and the, and the Dixie Chicks and that whole thing. And I worked for a small town uh, was newspaper in Wisconsin in the early 2000s. And I had to cover a lot of country music concerts because that's, that's like the only people that come to small town Wisconsin. So I covered like so many Toby Keith concerts at that time. And at that time, I hated Toby Keith because in my mind, he represented like the worst parts of like George Bush's America. Like this was like the walking, strutting personification of like cowboy up and you know all that kind of macho bullshit and so I hated him for that reason but then I started going to these concerts and I was like Toby Keith has some jams <laughs> you know I think I like I love this bar and uh, how do you like me now and uh, whiskey girl which is like a ridiculous song but it's kind of great or like um, American Soldier which to me, sounds like a song, like, like people who don't like Bruce Springsteen assume that every song sounds like American Soldier, you know? But to me, it sounds like a good outtake from like Lucky Town era, Bruce Springsteen. Um, so just kind of coming to that realization that like I could learn to appreciate something that culturally seems so opposite of like what I felt like, I w like the side that I was on uh, was an important like turning point in that regard. So. If you take anything from this night, it's to uh, listen to Toby Keith uh, when you get home. I was a fan of early Toby Keith, <laughs> so I liked, you know, before he sold out to, like, you know, the political side. Right, yeah. Dream Walking, what a great jam that is. That's a hot country jam from the mid-90s. But he kind of came around, like, when he was doing, like, Honky Tonk University, like that era, because he kind of got depoliticized, well, and he just and came then back. He, yes, then he completely backtracked on everything he that he stood for in, in the early 2000s. Yeah, well. Well, you know, he's not a he's not a thinker. He's a doer. You know, to <laughs> Toby Keith. He's not a polemicist. You know, you can't look for uh, deep political thought in his music. So, what about people who are? Just like above the idea of Robert, it's funny you mentioned Bruce Springsteen, and and I thought about him while you were writing the book. That there's no way you could slot him into any of these scenarios, just because the kind of artist that he is, you know, it, he's just Beyonce, another one. There's like it's it's amazing how like some artists just have this innate ability to sort of transcend any sort of yeah. whatever petty squabbles they might be involved with. There's never a. I wonder, like in the '80s, though, like did people pit him against like like Cougar, like Mellencamp? Because I feel... Uh, I mean... No. No? He was a publicist, probably. Yeah. There's a great Billy Joel interview from 1980 where 
where Billy Joel says, people are always trying to pit me against Bruce Springsteen, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know, but it, whereas, you know, you know, me and Bruce, we'd get along fine, but people see it as like a gang war, and, you know, <laughs> if, if like, if me and, I have no pretensions to Bruce's throne, he has a great quote, but if Bruce and I actually got to meet face to face, like, we'd say, yeah, let's go have a hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a choice of like, but it's, but it's like even in 1980. It's that like, would be amazing, yes. by the way. Like but, the, but the hot dog summit of Bruce Springsteen <laughs> and Billy Joel would be. But did, but did Billy really think that there was a, a feud with Bruce Springsteen where, well, I feel like people coming up to him and saying, you know, that guy sucks, but you, you are, you are getting it done. I mean, I want, I mean, I feel like on some level he must have felt in the eighties that Bruce Springsteen was getting so much critical attention. You know, he was like the man as far as rock critics were concerned and like Billy Joel could not, you know, get any love at all. So maybe, because I feel like when he made The Bridge, do you remember The Bridge? And he did that song, Matter of Trust. I feel like he was doing a Bruce Springsteen impression in that video, because he's, he's like the piano man and he's playing a guitar. And he did like, one, two, one, two, three, four. That's like such a Bruce Springsteen move. He is. And he's kind of jutting out his chin a little bit. And he's like rolling up his sleeves, you know? And it's, it seems yeah. like he's making Maybe doing like Bruce Springsteen cosplay in that <laughs> in that video, but I, I mean I love I mean you know they both do their own thing so well. Then he yeah. saw the light and said, you know, next time I make an album, I'm going to rap about the JFK assassination. <laughs> it's, it's like match this Springsteen. JFK blown away. What else? Because it's like because Bruce tried to do that a little bit on 57 channels and nothing on. It was kind of like a rap sort of, but I feel like yeah, Billy Joel won the white classic rocker rap duel. Well, Maybe, I don't know. I, you can't ignore Tweeter and the Monkey Man. Oh, Tweeter and the Monkey Man. That's the shot. I mean, that's the moment of rivalry. That's true. Oh, wait. Tom Petty and Dylan took that shot at Bruce. Was that? Yeah. Oh, on oh, the uh, Trevor. Yeah. Oh. That song is them deconstructing and taking apart Bruce. That's true. See, Brian would know. See, I, I could see you chomping at the bit over there. Over there. That's a great point, though. Yeah. Because yeah, the, the, the petty thing, and yeah, that is good. I haven't listened to that Trapping Wilburys album in a long time. Does that hold up? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> Second one doesn't. Second one doesn't? Okay. This one really does. And Tweeter and the Monkey Man is so incredibly good. And also, it was so weird to hear in 1988. It was like, Bob Dylan remembers how to be funny. It was like so out of whack with anything he'd done in such a long time. And that he was making jokes about Springsteen, making jokes about himself. I, that's interesting because I've never thought of Petty as like the main player in that song. So I love this crowd that I can just say, does the Traveling Wilburys album hold up? And people have, opi people have opinions on it. Like this, this, like you're my people. Like I love, I love this crowd. That's, that's the best. Cause I, I feel like in most crowds, it'd be like, uh, no, I, what? I have no idea what you're saying. So, I, 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 I think they seated the pro traveling Wilbury and, <laughs> and the people who think the second album <laughs> is the second album. People like them. Well, Roy Orbison died. I don't think he's on the second record. People so. really like the second one, though. Okay. Well. well <laughs> yeah. Uh, should we go to more questions? Yeah, yeah. Should we do? Yeah, let's let's do Q and A. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Hi. Um, so, well, first of all, never. No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, that Kanye does have sex. Like, it's as likely as any other. I just didn't want to presume that, you know. But you're right. I like. The real question is, and you talked about this a little bit on Twitter and online. How is it a feud album and how is it not? How is it a feud album and how is it not? Yeah, I didn't want to ask you to know. Um, right? Well, I mean, it, it's so weird with Beyonce because I feel like she's one of those artists that, like, she's hasn't been talking to the media at all. I, I like, when's the last time she did an interview? She doesn't do interviews. She does movies. She does movies now. It is like this is what I have instead of an interview. Before the Super Bowl, man. So, I mean, is it a feud album with Jay Z? Is what you're asking? Um, I mean, I don't know, like. What, like, what's your take on this? I I don't know to what degree we can. I, I, mean, I don't necessarily hear it strictly as that. It doesn't seem like that to me necessarily. Like that's that's like an example of like how. 
uh, like, like how, how on an elevated plane Beyonce is that if this were anybody else I mean Jay-Z has been like hiding in a bunker with Jimmy Hoffa for the past three months yeah. literally everybody on earth has been listening to his wife do these songs uh, and and he has been like he is not taking the shots it's really kind of amazing that like I mean it's astounding that this this is yet in a, another example that there's only one Beyonce and that that she's on this rarefied plane where she could do this and it's not a rival because nobody is capable of standing uh, up. Yeah, I mean because there's really been no response. I mean there's a, there's like rumors that maybe they they didn't that they did a record together. I mean, Jay-Z really seems like Beyonce's husband at this point. Like, that seems to be his identity. And, uh, I mean, Jay-Z to me is just such an interesting character anyway because he is the... Uh, I mean, I wrote a thing a couple years ago like, where I called him, like, the Rolling Stones of rap. You know, like, how, like, there hasn't really been another rapper like him where he could do a stadium tour <laughs> based purely just on nostalgia at this point. Like, it seems like most rappers, they sort of, ex like, once they extinguish their sort of significance culturally they recede and they're not famous anymore but like Jay-Z still is famous even though he doesn't seem like a guy that has like a ton of like pop capital at the moment and a lot of that is due to like his wife talking about him like on her records or seeming to talk about him on her records so I don't know if it's a feud it's a very like one-sided feud where like it's Beyonce and like a smoking crater <laughs> on the other side and like can you have a feud with a smoking crater I don't know I said earlier about you can ask a Packers question by the way no okay not you okay um, you said earlier about bringing baggage uh, when you listen to stuff like we all do obviously especially the longer you're on the earth the more you've heard do you find it difficult to get into slash enjoy new music I find like and I'm a, I'm a huge music nerd I'm going to devour this. I can't wait. Yeah. But, like, I find it so difficult today to get into music in a way that I did when I was 25. I, I, I haven't hit that wall yet. I still love hearing new music. And I, part of it has to do with how I see music. I, 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 I'm from the school. I, you know, there's this idea that, like, music continually re it reinvents itself and that there's always, you know, that you, that you dispose of the past and you kind of reinvent the present and look towards the future. Whereas I look at it more maybe from, like, the blues perspective where it's a continuum of artists, you know? So, like... I'm always curious to see how the new artists are going to take what already exists, put their own spin on it, and push it forward. You know, I feel like a lot of people reach a certain wall where they just get bored with it, where they feel like, well, this is just recreating something I've already heard. And that's where the, maybe they start to lose interest a little bit, because they feel like, well, there's this music that I loved in the past that is so great, and I don't feel like anything's ever gonna top that. Um, that's what I feel like anyway when I look at other people my age, you know, they, they just kind of hit that wall. Whereas for me, I feel like, no, like, I want to see what the new version of uh, you know, the latest iteration of like the four piece rock band is going to do, you know, and uh, because I like hearing how they're drawing on something that's already there, but then there's always going to be something else on top of that, even if it's just like a weird sound in someone's voice or something in the production or taking something that's on the pop charts now and infusing it with like the Rolling Stones from 69, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, Cause I feel like that's what music has always been, you know, like there's no such thing as something that's totally new. That's just invented that never existed before. Like I, I think everything has roots and uh, I like, I'm fascinated by that sort of generational conversation that happens in music. So um, I don't know. I could, Tell you some artists maybe that you'd want to check out, or we'll see. Or listen, or or keep listening to Prince. Like I've been listening to Prince too, so that holds up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, one of the sort of off better question. Uh, one of the notable rivalries not mentioned in the book uh, was the Jay Z v Nasta. Yeah. Was there a reason that omission? 
Yeah, that was actually in my proposal. Yeah. I planned to write about that, and I don't know why it didn't get in. Like, there were a couple other ones. I, I had, in one draft, I had, like, Frank Ocean and Chris Brown in there, because I thought that would have been, like, the ultimate good versus evil story, you know? <laughs> but, you know, I think maybe what stopped me with Jay-Z versus Nas is that I felt like a lot has already been said about that and I didn't know exactly what I had to contribute to that, you know? Because that was sort of like the two qualifications for the book. One was like, one was that I wanted to focus on rivalries where there was actually some interaction between the artists. You know, because for instance, like one thing I had early on was like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, which is like a classic argument between, for like heavy metal, hard rock people. Like who's more responsible for inventing this genre and who's the better band? But like there wasn't like really any real competition between those bands like at their peaks like I think John Bonham and Bill Ward hung out because they were like from Birmingham and and stuff but like th they didn't really travel like in the same circles really so I didn't write about that the other thing was do I have anything unique to say about this and I think in the Jay-Z Nas uh, instance I just thought about it. I was like, I feel like a lot's been said about it, and I, d I just don't have anything. So it's like, I'll just cede to Jay-Z on TakeOver. It's like, just listen to TakeOver, and you can get everything you need to know about that rivalry. Like, I'm not going to top Jay-Z on that song. <laughs> anything I write, so... Yeah. I had a question about, um, were you looking at any artists who maybe have like a rivalry or something in their turmoil with him or herself? consider any, or, or somebody like Bob Dylan who tours now and almost kind of tries to subvert his legacy based on some arrangements. So like an inner rivalry? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, in a way, I did that because I wrote a chapter about Pink Floyd, about like Roger Waters versus the rest of Pink Floyd. So, in a way, that that was a way to talk about that. Um, but no, that would have been interesting. That's like kind of like more of like a meta look at at that kind of thing. You know, it could have been like Neil Young versus like '80s Neil Young. You know, yeah. like, like like when he got sued for sound like for not sounding enough like himself. You know, like that like by like David Geffen. Like, I don't know if you guys know about that story, the David Geffen thing. Like he was signed to Geffen Records and Geffen sued Neil Young because he was making records like Trans and Life that were not guitar and harmonica records. They were just really weird and Geffen was like, what? You, you don't sound like Neil Young, you know? This is outrageous. So that might have been a good one there. But um, but yeah, like I think the Pink Floyd one. I like the idea of like an inner band thing. Like even in the Beatles Stones chapter, I talk a lot about like Mick and Keith and John and Paul and how in a way that was like a similar dynamic where you have like one guy who's kind of holding the band together and the other guy who's like the cool guy you know like like John and Keith are like the cool guys and like Mick and Paul were like oh no we gotta get to you know we gotta make records you know we gotta get in the studio you know so that being an interesting dynamic in those bands so yes um, so when you were talking about Toby Keith and what I made of him originally, you know, to you, he represented, and probably to a lot of people, he represented that everything that was wrong with the book presidency. So I'm wondering, as you did your work on the rivalries, did you notice any um, general general observations about people, depending on which side they took in the rivalry, that revealed something about their personalities or their beliefs? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things, that's like one of the big kind of themes in the book about, is about how um, people use culture to, as a way, of, it's as a way of defining themselves and also as like a shorthand for understanding other people, you know, like how, um, I mean, I think that's certainly true in high school. If you're really, if you're one of those kids who's like a big music person, you know, like when you get into a certain genre, it can become like an instant personality kit. You know, like if you're a, if you're a metalhead, there's a certain way to dress. If you're a metalhead, there's a certain way to talk. You know, there's a, you know there's a there's a philosophy, a worldview. It's a lifestyle. You know, same thing if you're a punk or if you're really into hip hop or or whatever. Um, but I also think in a way that continues as you get older, uh, because especially now in the social media era, where it's so easy to curate your personality online. And part of the way that you do that a lot of times is 
by your cultural preferences. You know, you talk about certain albums that you like or certain films or TV shows. And in a way, there's there's certain sort of characteristics that are coded into that, you know, like where we know like, well, if you like this kind of TV show, maybe you're this kind of person or, or, or whatever. Um, and in a lot of ways, I feel like people aren't always conscious of that, but then they also sort of are conscious of it. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a real kind of performative aspect of fandom online, you know, that uh, where you're, you're communicating that you really love something, um, but you're also trying to communicate something about yourself in a way. Like, I am the kind of person who loves this. Like, and I always use this example, but like, I felt like during the last Super Bowl halftime show, that was a very clear example of that like I am the kind of person who loves Beyonce and hates Coldplay you know that was a very sort of people were very loud about announcing their sort of preferences in that and I'm not saying that that's like uh, affected or something I mean I think people are being honest in their preferences with that kind of thing but I I do think that there is also a code in that a little bit you know like there's a certain kind of person that likes this a certain kind of person that likes that so i feel like this book is about exploring that and also trying to find a way to get beyond it you know uh, because i don't think that is a great way to really determine what kind of person you are I mean, it's obviously not true i mean we're you know we're all complex human beings and you know your your music taste ultimately isn't that important you know in what kind of person you are. And that's something we all know instinctively, I think, but um, I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting thing to talk about a little bit. Yes? Uh, well, regarding the social media that you talk about from the artistic and critical standpoint, I think that the access to so much information from the artists themselves and all the press involved in music releases now takes away from some of the mythology and mystery. Um, and like, what, what would these people's Twitter accounts have been like? What would yeah. How would that have affected what you wrote about? I don't know. I mean, I think I don't. I mean, I think there's a new kind of mythology. You know, the idea in the '70s or something was that you would not say much about yourself or like if you were Led Zeppelin or something like you weren't going to do interviews with people because it was like about the mystique and you're going to put like you know guys carrying twigs on your album covers and <laughs> and like to have weird symbols and people would have to read into it um, but you know I think that there is a certain kind of mythology that gets built with Instagram accounts and Twitter accounts and you know people have ideas about, about what, what Drake is like now and Beyonce that comes from social media um, it's a just, uh, you know, it's a different kind of projection in a way, you know, it, it seems more spelled out, but at the same time, is an Instagram account any more truthful than an album cover? You know, there does seem to be like, again, like Led Zeppelin was telling you as much as they wanted to tell you about themselves with their iconography, but like, you know, Beyonce and Taylor Swift, and they're, they do the same thing. Uh, it's just with different instruments in a way, I think. Well, the level of analysis is so sophisticated, too, because each one of these clues has so much back and forth about it. It's kind of amazing that, you know, if you, I mean, if you talk to a directioner about Harry Styles' tattoos <laughs> and what each of them mean and the chronology, and it's funny that, you know, you think about something like, you know, that we grew up with something like, you know, Paul is dead and, like, looking for the clues. Oh, he's barefoot on the album cover. Right. And or I feel like now, like, too, like, Taylor Swift was just, like, she crashed a wedding this weekend, and that was, like, a big thing on social media, that it was, like, an Instagram that she crashed a wedding, and there's, like, sort of the direct thing where it's like, oh, wow, Taylor Swift crashed a wedding, but then you see like the meta commentary on it it's like well is taylor swift trying to communicate that she's an average person who just crashes weddings and she's trying to like tell you that she's normal and is this how she does that you know and and then you see that it kind of goes down that path where it's like well why would she crash a wedding is this like a reflective of her songwriting in a way because she writes a lot about relationships is she telling some, us something about her feelings on the institution of marriage and blah 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 like you can really go down wormholes online with you know people analyzing instagram photos and and tweets and you know that's what gets analyzed now maybe more than album covers or liner notes you know
But yeah, I, I think mythology is always going to exist. That's why pop stars exist. They exist for us to project our fantasies onto them. And, uh, you know, that's why people argue so much about, like, is Beyonce a feminist? You know, like, you know, like that, that being an issue. It's like some people want her to be this. Some people want her to be that. And uh, it's what she intends, but then it's also what we create in the public's imagination, you know. And, and in a way, that kind of takes over, I think, even more than what any artist could ever intend. Yeah. What was the most fun chapter for you writing? I liked writing about celebrity boxing matches. <laughs> That was fun, because it's always fun to write about Axl Rose, too. Like, he's my favorite rock star, probably, of all time. Um, but, you know, you mentioned the Clapton Hendrix chapter. That was a lot of fun to write, just because it's always fun when you can write something where you discover something about the subject and also yourself as you're doing it. You know, and certainly, I, I think going into that chapter, I expected it to be just an excuse to make fun of Eric Clapton. And when I came out the other end of it, I was like, wow, I am Eric Clapton. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And he is me, and we're all one, you know? And that's, and that was kind of a mind-blowing thing to uh, come to, and but I'm glad, I'm glad I felt that. You know, empathy is a good thing. I think if you can find that, uh, that's, it's always, it's always a great thing to, to have. Sort of similar question. After you finished writing everything, was there a particular artist that you came away with a new appreciation for or a renewed appreciation for? Yeah, I would say Sinead O'Connor was a big one for me. Like, um, and this was another thing that like we, we talked about a little bit. Like Sinead O'Connor had a couple close calls, like in the last couple months, where like she was like missing in Chicago a couple weeks ago. And uh, I was obviously concerned about Sinead O'Connor's well being, but I also thought like, oh, she's in my book. <laughs> like I don't want her to pass away. Uh, you know that would that'd be weird for the book but yeah I mean I because I, I wrote about her in the Miley Cyrus uh, Sinead O'Connor chapter and I remember that whole SNL incident um, you know before she tore up the picture of the Pope and um, it didn't end her career but it certainly hurt her career tremendously and I think at the time, you know, I was really young, I was more inclined to just sort of go with the crowd and think, oh, she's just being kooky or something. And going back and reading about the reaction to that and just watching the video of that performance, you know, she sings War, that Bob Marley song. I really think it's like one of the greatest TV performances like I've ever seen. It's like, it's like so powerful. She's like a hardcore band in this song. It's so intense and so angry and there's just like no irony to it at all. It's just someone laying it out on the table. This is what I think and then I'm going to do this very deliberate, direct protest. And, you know, and she was protesting the church covering up cases of sexual abuse, which, you know, she was way ahead of the curve on that, obviously. You know, and it's just so terrible, like, what she went through. Like, she went, like, I think it was the next week or a week after she was at a Bob Dylan tribute concert and got booed off the stage. It's like, can you think of a like easier metaphor there like for just uh, you know she's going to an artist who's been being saluted for his you know protest songs and all that stuff and here's a, here's an artist who's being who, who protested and is being booed off the stage um so i just had a lot of respect for her after that and i think she's a really great artist and uh, i hope she can have a proper comeback you know uh, even though you know she's kind of had some latter day eccentricities to put it lightly, but I don't know. I think she's a great artist. Brian. Other than as a um, some kind of coded expression of who we are, have you thought about why it is that we care so deeply? What did you come away with as a conclusion? Now, I read this sentence you write about why David Lee Roth fans decided they had to hate Sandy Hagar, and I mean you have 20 ways to rebut your sort of reductive but <laughs> right? well, why I'm 50 now? You know, I cared about that when I was 16. Why do, why do we care so much about our favorite musical acts and why are we willing to engage in that? I just think that this is something that uh, at least a certain kind of person, they take and they infuse it into their own 
personality, and it's a way it, it becomes kind of part of the fa part of the fabric of who they are. And uh, especially if you're a person who was affected by music at a really early age, um, where it's not just a preference that you have. It's like this represents. It's part of my soul, in a way. It's part of the essence of who I am, that this is articulating something about myself that I could never articulate myself. Um, but it's true, you know, the, this person's kind of representing, you know, an essential part of who I am. And I, I think that there's a lot of validity to that. I also think that there is an element of, like, you know, I, I write in there that like having a relationship with an album is like having an, an imaginary friend, you know? And I think like if you are the kind of person who has had bad times in your life and music was the only thing that you had, you know, like you listen to an album and that seemed to be the only thing that understood what you were going through, that there is an act of imagination with that, you know? You needed that album because there was maybe not a person there for you, that this album was like the only thing you had, so you had to project human characteristics almost onto this sort of anatomic piece of music. Um, but just because it's imaginary doesn't mean it's not strong and it doesn't mean it doesn't sort of stick with you forever. Um, you know, that's just a testament though to how great art is, you know. I'm gonna make a pro-art argument here. <laughs> art is good, you know. That's why art I think transcends politics and so many other things that, you know, we talk about artists hundreds of years after uh, they were alive uh, because they create these uh, connections with us, you know, even after they're gone. Um, so, in a nutshell, I think that's, that's what I would say about that. People like that with sports teams or with cars or with poets. There's all these different things. To I think so. But, you know, sports, too, I think is maybe even more transient than, than art. I don't know. Like, I guess we still talk about some, I mean, you know, Muhammad Ali is a great example of a guy who seems immortal long after, you know, his peak as an athlete passed, you know. But um, I don't know. We're a room full of music people, not sports people. So let's just talk about, you know, for us it's music. I mean, maybe for someone else it's sports, but um, for a certain kind of person anyway, I think music really strikes a chord that you can't even articulate in a way. You know, it's so deep. It becomes part of you. Time for uh, one more. Yeah. Uh, so, this is your first book, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, so, when you were, either when you were writing this or just another point, what's kind of the best? Yeah, I would just say, um, and this is probably true of any kind of writing, is that um, you, uh, it's important to have friends and to talk to other people and to hear other people's thoughts, but at some point you have to go away from the crowd and live inside your own head and just experience things the way only you can experience it um, because uh, you know especially now it's so easy just to get sucked into cultural conversations and I feel like that has a way of homogenizing people's opinions and the result of that is that you just have a lot of a boring opinions um, so you have to turn all that stuff off and just go off on your own and be inside your own head and be like well what does this mean to me and I you know, and this is a cliche, but I think it's true that like the most personal feelings that you have, the things that you're embarrassed by, the things that you think no one would ever connect to, those are the things that other people will connect to. Like, you'll, you'll be shocked when you write it down and you think, this is almost embarrassing. Like, this, this is so insular that no one will get this. And then other people will read it and they'll say, that's exactly what I was thinking. I was just waiting for someone else to say it. And if you can get to that place, that's just the place you want to be. So that would be my advice in that regard. Stephen Hyden. Hey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much to both.